Good evening. This is the April 13th, 2023 meeting of the St. Mary's County Board of Appeals located in the Commissioner's Conference, Commissioners of St. Mary's County Meeting Room of the Chesapeake Building, 41770 Baldridge Street, Leonardtown, Maryland. I'm Chairman Dan Ignaowski with four other board members present. Having met our minimum requirement for a quorum, we'll, we, we will proceed with the meeting. Residents may view the meeting on Channel 95 and YouTube. All case documents may be viewed on the county's board doc site. I will open the meeting up for public testimony after the presentations and testimonies by the applicants and representatives which have been completed. For in-person public testimony, you'll be asked to state your name and address for the record, and I will swear you in. You will have three minutes to ask your questions or make your comments directly to the board. Your comments will be recorded and heard by those of us in the Chesapeake Building, Channel 95, and on YouTube. After the public comment portion of the meeting is over, the case will be returned to the board for any closing comments, members' discussion, and decision. And now I'd like to ask the board members to introduce themselves, starting on my left. Guy Bradley, good evening. Good evening, Rich Richardson. And again, I'm Dan Ikniowski. Good evening, Lynn Delahaye. Wayne Medensky. <clears throat> and also we have the attorney for the board, Mr. Steve Scott, and we have our alter alternate member in the back, Mr. R Ronald Payne. Um, we also have county staff that is here tonight to help us, John Hauser, the assistant county attorney. Uh, Courtney's not here tonight. Um, Amanda Yao, zoning administrator, Stacy Clements, planner three, Jim Gotch is not here tonight yet. Um, and we will then continue. We have three public hearings on the agenda this evening. Case number one, Upton Variance, has been withdrawn by the applicant. So there will nothing be heard on that first case. The second case will be Rose Hill VAAP. A variance from Schedule 32.1 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance to reduce the left side yard setback from 10 feet to zero to construct a boathouse and reduce the side yard setback from 10 feet to zero to construct a dwelling with, two, with a two-story deck. And with that, uh, who's going to begin that one? I will ask staff to stand and take the oath. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Stacy. <coughs> okay. um, okay, good evening, board members. There we go. Tonight's first public hearing is variance application 22-0313, the Rose Hill property. They are requesting a variance from schedule 32.1 of the St. Mary's Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance to reduce the left side yard setback from 10 feet to zero feet to construct a boathouse and to reduce the side yard setback from 10 feet to zero feet to construct a dwelling with a two-story deck. The legal advertisement was printed on March 24th and 31st, 2023 in the Southern Maryland News. Certified mailings were sent to the adjacent property owners located within 200 feet of the project property. And a public hearing sign was posted on the property on or before March 29th, 2023. <clears throat> the property owner is Rose Hills Properties, LLC. The representative is Chris Longmore and the property consists of 8,152 square feet and is currently undeveloped. The property is located on St. George's Park Road in Tall Timbers. It is owned residential low density district. The applicant is proposing a single family dwelling with a detached boathouse. The site plan is exempt from stormwater management requirement 
since the site plan proposes less than 5,000 square feet of soil disturbance. It is currently being reviewed by Land Use and Growth Management, the St. Mary's County Health Department, the St. Mary's County Metropolitan Commission, and um, floodplain. Okay, the applicant is proposing a single family dwelling with the attached or detached boathouse as seen on this site plan. The site plan depicts the required 10 foot setbacks for the principal structure. Schedule 32.1 footnote 11 states that the side yard setbacks for an accessory structure such as the boathouse is five feet. The boathouse is set approximately 4.5 feet away from the side property line. Okay. Okay. Now the standards for granting a variance. Okay. Except as provided in sections 23 point or 24.3, 24.4, and 24.5, the Board of Appeals shall not vary the regulations of this ordinance unless it makes the final, makes findings based upon evidence presented to it that, because one, because of a particular, uh, peculiar <laughs> physical surroundings such as exceptional narrowness, shallowness, size, shape, or topographical conditions of the property involved, strict enforcement of this ordinance will result in a practical difficulty. Number two, the conditions creating the difficulty are not applicable in generally to other properties within the same zoning classification. And three, the purpose of the variance is not based exclusively upon reasons of convenience, profits, and caprice. It is understood that any development necessary increases property value, and that alone shall not constitute an exclusive finding. And four, the alleged difficulty was not created by the property owner or the owner's predecessor in title. And five, the granting of the variance will not be detrimental to the public welfare or interest to other property or improvements in the neighborhood, and that the character of the district will not be changed with the variance. And six, the proposed variance will not substantially increase the congestion of public streets or increase the danger of fire or endanger the public safety or substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood. And seven, the variance complies as nearly as possible with the spirit, intent, and purpose of the comprehensive plan. Are there any questions? Um, yes, sir. In, in our packet, I didn't see anything from the critical area. Did they have any comments or? Uh, this isn't a critical area variance, it's a setback variance. Um, it's currently under review with our um, environmental planner for um, meeting the critical area standards. It's also located in the IDA and it's a BMO property, so a variance wouldn't be required. Okay. Okay. The variance wouldn't be required as long as they meet other conditions. Correct, correct. For the property. Yes, okay. they'll have to do their plantings and. And it does appear that by the site plan that they have done that? Um, so the site plan is currently under review um, by our environmental reviewer. I believe he made a request for uh, uh, environmental quality site plan, which would delineate the buffer um, and any clearing for the project. And then he would be able from there to make the calculations for the mitigation that's required. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I can look at the diagram and I can see where the house is on the pro on the line yes sir. I see that the boathouse is not yet the right up is zero let's see correct it, it was the applicant that requested the zero setback okay thank you where would the zero setback be I see it on the house but again like mr. Richardson said I don't see it on the boathouse yeah, I will defer to the applicant okay, for that fine. question. Okay. Any other questions? The applicant. Mr. Longmore, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, good evening, members of the board as well. Uh, for the record, Chris Longmore with Dugan McKissick and Longmore here on behalf of the applicant, Rose Hill Properties, LLC. I also let the board know that Bill and Sue Murray, who are the purchasers of this property, are here with me tonight. They're the ones that, uh, particularly Mr. Murray, has been involved in the design of the property and can be available for any questions you have relating to that that I might not be able to answer. Um, before I get into the the uh, PowerPoint, uh, I'll echo some of the comments that staff made that the only request that we have for you tonight is a variance request from the setback requirements. Um, and to give you a little background of, of why we're here and how it came about that these were needed, um, Rose Hill Properties LLC, uh, my client, owns lots nine and eight in this block one of this subdivision. Uh, the original plan was to consolidate those two lots and uh, build a house that would not need um, side yard setback variances, it would be built somewhere in the center of it. Um, there's actually a lot consolidation agreement that was put into place, but after that was done in review with the county for this development, it was discovered that there's um, a 10 foot um, platted area that appears to be some type of, of potential right of way that was designed in 1930 when the original plat was done. Um, that is why, and I'll show you when we get to the, to the slides where that is, there's actually a strip of property running through the two lots that my client has that they're intending to develop as one use, um, that the county did not feel comfortable allowing my client to build on top of that because it's on the 1930 plat. Um, so in working with the county, including the land use office um, and the county attorney's office, the best approach we uh, believe and that, that everyone agreed is that my client would attempt to design it not to disturb that 10 feet, knowing that they probably would need a setback variance from that um, in order to, to get a viable use of these lots. The lots are very small, as you'll see. So that's where this came from. There is another uh, setback that I'll show you on um, a side yard that is adjacent to some property owned by the county as well. Um, and talking to Mr. Hauser, I understand the county does not object uh, to, that, to that request to get a variance from that. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the design and kind of why it was done that way, why the house is on the lot, it's on, and the, and the other structures on the other one as, as we go forward. Uh, but that's why we're here tonight. That's why it's a little unique to need a side yard setback in the middle of the, of the house and the proposed boathouse. Um, because of this um, sliver of land that from what we can tell and from what my clients know um, has never been used for anything. It's, it's always sat there undeveloped as, and appears to be part of our land. So if we go to the, the first slide, um, I'll start walking through some of the descriptions of the property and I have the, the clicker, I'm sorry. Um, so this is an aerial photo. Um, you can see the the indication there of 17931 St. George's Park Road, that uh, enclosed area shows both of the lots of my client and the area uh, from which the uh, variances are needed. Immediately above that, um, to the left and above it, um, is the area that I mentioned, the, the lots that are owned by the county um, that we will be seeking a variance on the side yard uh, to that property as well. Um, and you can see immediately below our, my client's property, there is a property already developed um, with a house. I understand the, the Aldridge family owns, owns that property. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is just a, a larger blow up of, of the same lot, so you can see. Um, and again, that is actually lots eight and nine um, that my client uh, owns um, completely both of them. Now, if we go to the uh, next photos, there are some photos, and I don't know if the board has had a chance uh, to see these. You can see the, the property that we're here discussing. I'm es essentially in the left portion of this photo, kind of showing that it is undeveloped at this time. Um, this is another view of it uh, from a different angle where you can see the, the house on the, on the neighboring property. Um, this is another uh, picture of it with some of the, the greenery and trees that you can see on the property. Um, this is another kind of picture of it looking down the road um, to give you some, some sense of the property. I believe that's looking toward the county property as well. Some of that's in the background near where that vehicle is parked. Um, this again is the house next door. So you can see the house and then my client's property is in the background uh, beyond that house. 
And then these are some of the site plans and proposed plans that um, are in the packet already. Um, you can see on the left is the proposed dwelling uh, with the deck that was mentioned by staff uh, with the driveway leading into it. And to the right of that, um, it's called a boat house on the plans and, and, in the, uh, and in the reports, it's essentially gonna be a boat storage kind of house. There, were, there was a comment in, in one of the public comments that it's not really a boat house. Um, it's really intended to be a kind of a storage garage type area that, that could um, serve also to house, house a boat or similar um, vessel. Now if we, so that, that's the layout. You'll see to the left there of that dark green line going down the side um, is the property owned by the county, the vacant property that's owned by the county. And you can see that um, the house um, is near the property line over there. There is a variance needed on that side um, in order to construct a dwelling. Um, and the right side of the house, as you're viewing it on this slide, as, as was mentioned during the staff report, is immediately along the property line of that 10 foot strip. So it's not a neighboring property that can be developed in any way, but it's a unusable strip down the center of my client's property that they're asking for a variance from there. Um, and then you can see what's labeled there is the boathouse again, or the storage structure um, that is there on the really lot eight that is in between what is the proposed house and the neighboring house of Mr. and Mrs. Aldridge. Now that design was intentional by my client. It is um, a neighborhood that has some houses there. My clients wanted to be as respectful as they could to their future neighbor and not build their house on the lot immediately next to their house, even though arguably they have a buildable right to do that. They thought it'd be better to build next to the vacant lot owned by the county and have the house there and only have the boat house in between to allow more privacy uh, for both families. Um, so that's uh, part of the intentional design uh, that my clients had of the property. Now this slide is, is the one that is probably most useful in looking at what our requests are. Um, you can see again the proposed house on the, on the left side on lot nine there. Um, that um, hatched area with the red strips shows you what appears to be again an old platted uh, strip with potential beach access. Um, again, it has not been used by anybody as best as my clients can tell, and it certainly physically does not appear uh, to have been used in, in any way. Um, it's sitting there undeveloped, uh, but my clients are trying to respect the fact that it's there um, and, and working with the county to come up with a plan so they can use the two lots that they have. So the, the orange areas are where the side yard setbacks, um, we're asking for the waiver, the variance, uh, from those setback requirements. You can see on the left side up against the county commissioner property, uh, the, the setback variance that we need really varies. Um, you can see the 10 feet that's shown there in orange. Um, it's not exactly zero, the whole stretch of it and, and even the corner of the house is not right on the property line. Should the, the board want to grant a variance as depicted here um, in those measurements, that would be fine. But we thought since it was variable, um, we thought that that would be appropriate to ask for the zero foot there again, my understanding from Mr. Hauser is the county uh, does not object to that in any way. The other two area strips, the middle one and the one to the right, are the uh, the areas where we need a variance from the setback from that unused 10-foot undeveloped strip. Um, so that's why it's listed there. Certainly for the house, a zero uh, that would need to be reduced to zero. I believe the boat house has shown us about four feet or four and a half feet. Off of that line, that would certainly, this is the design my, my clients intend to pursue. Um, so if the board is more comfortable granting that, um, but we thought for, for that house, um, that's why we would request that. And again, that you can see that the 10 foot building restriction line that might be able to be moved over a little bit further to the right. There are some other uh, design features that would make that difficult. Um, again, we wanna work with the, with the neighbors and we thought this was the best design. Um, in order to allow that to be there. So that's essentially the visual depiction of what we're asking for the setbacks from. It's a little unusual. I don't believe I've ever seen one like this where we're asking for a setback from a strip of land that's not being used by anybody. So a lot of the concerns that are often there for granting setbacks against a neighbor that it might infringe on their ability to use it uh, to build something else or build another, another structure near it. Um, we don't believe that comes into play at all. Um, and again, we don't think that'll be an issue with the county commissioner property and, and there's no objections that we've received from them. 
Um, this is another just design showing where we believe the critical area uh, buffer is. Again, it's in environmental review for the other permits for the property. I'll reiterate what staff said in response to Mr. Medinsky's question. This is not a critical area variance. Uh, my client does not need any of this as far as we're aware. Um, the standards letter that I submitted in the packet included both in case it was determined during that review that we would need one. Uh, but between the time I submitted the letter and tonight's hearing, we received confirmation from the county that no critical area variance was needed. So that's why we're only before you for the setback variance. Um, and then this is uh, another view of one of the proposed plans. It was a little clean, cleaner without the, the colors on it if that helped us uh, discuss it tonight. Um, so we're, we're here, we believe we, we can meet all of the standards and it's in the, the first three pages, I believe, of the letter that is part of an exhibit of the staff report uh, that was submitted on March 2nd of this year. Um, all of the standards that Ms. Clements went through, we've addressed in that letter. You can see the lots are exceptionally narrow. My client owns both of them. Um, oftentimes in working with the county, they would, I believe, express the desire to my client to combine the lots to allow a different development. It's simply impossible with that strip running through it uh, that was not discovered until um, we, we began this process. So in working with the county, we believe that there would be a significant practical difficulty in developing this property without these variances. Um, the setbacks on either side of, of, of it are necessary, that's a, a typographical error there. It would really deny my client a reasonable use of both lots if there's not setback relief given here with that strip running through the middle of it. Uh, we don't believe it would be necessary without that strip being there. There was a design that my client had, if they could build on top of that, that both side yards would be respected on either side, but having locating the house in between that strip and the other property line uh, required the setback uh, variance. Um, and we don't believe that the development will in any way adversely affect the neighborhood. Uh, it is a residential neighborhood. That's the use that my client's proposing. They have a right to do so. There is a road maintenance agreement. I saw some concerns in, in some of the comments that were online about that. My client is a party to that road maintenance agreement. I can certainly provide a copy uh, for, the, for the board if you wish to know that, where they have been um, a full member of that agreement even without it being developed. Um, and that is in land records recorded at book 5641, page 379. Um, and I'll submit that to Stacy. so there's a copy in the record for the, for the board. Um, a couple other comments that I'd just like to make, and then certainly we can answer um, any questions. There is a letter from um, a couple that is a neighboring property to it that addressed some concerns. Uh, my client um, saw that before the hearing. Um, my client being Mr. Murray, who's here tonight, Bill Murray, the, the purchaser rather, um, and he has uh, communicated with them by phone to, to try to talk through some of the issues and he actually met with them this weekend. So he's been trying to work with the neighbors to allay any concerns. I think some of the uh, concerns um, they have is that it's their neighborhood and, and they're concerned about having a, a house built on one of the lots that's that close to them. Um, but I, I'm proud to be here with Mr. Murray tonight who is somebody that's willing to go and talk to the neighbors and not shy away from try to work with them in any way they can. And really the design of this, even some of the comments in that I think have been clarified since the comments were submitted. There is no variance being requested as the property line of the Aldridges, which is the developed property to the right as you were looking at our photos. That um, setback will be honored as the, the ordinance requires. It's only the internal setbacks and the one with the county that we're asking for. Um, again, which my client, uh, even before those comments came in, designed it that way to try to be respectful and design it in a way that was the least impactful to, the, to his uh, neighbors. Um, so with that, that's really our presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions specifically about any of those standards. They are addressed in my letter um, in detail there, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And Mr. Murray's here. Uh, if you have any questions of him about the design or any other questions, I can't answer. Questions from the board members? You know I do. Uh, Mr. Longmore, um, has the county been helpful when trying to uh, resolve this issue since both lots are now under new management or a new owner? They have been, and I think <laughs> and the only reason I hesitate at all is that the county was thorough in, in discovering the 10-foot strip that was through the property. So if it wasn't discovered, um, we probably wouldn't even be here tonight. But once it was, and I reviewed it, I can see it on the plot, I think the county was right uh, in its review. 
Um, they've been very helpful in trying to come up with a solution to this to allow my client to get a reasonable use of the property and the purchaser to get a reasonable use of the property. Um, we've had multiple phone calls and, and other communications with both the county attorney's office and land use staff, including Mr. Hunt when he was director, but also following up with the staff and um, preparing for tonight. So they've all been very helpful. With yeah. If your client decides to put up a fence, are they going to have to come back and get a waiver because now that's going to deny access to that plat? <clears throat> So that, um, that would be more, I believe, of a property rights question of, of folks that would, would have the right to do that. I don't believe there would be any permitting required for a fence. There's no plans that I know of for them uh, to do that at this point. Um, and that would be um, more of an issue in a civil court to determine those type of issues than any permitting. My understanding is there wouldn't be any permit for that type of fence. It would be more a dispute with so, whoever would be claiming a right to use it. But there's no intention. Uh, to do that at this point. With that being said, though, they would be allowed to put up a fence, but they're not allowed to build over that plat. Right, and kind of block block that area. They're not allowed to build structures on that area. But it's, they could block that area from people entering and leaving. That would that would be a, a if anybody claimed a right to use, and my clients would have to resolve that, and they're <laughs> hopeful that won't occur. Again, it hasn't been used that we can tell since night. You know, we don't know how long, but certainly in the last decades, it hasn't been used in any way by anyone. Right, and the method of my questioning was just to show the silliness of this problem. So we've got it on record, you got it on video, and truly the county can help. Right. They should be able to. Right. Because that's silly. Yeah. Mr. Right. Richardson, any questions? No, oh, sure. <clears throat> Yeah, I was just wondering, um, two questions. The strip of land, how close are you to a resolution with the county? There's really no dispute with the county. The only, um, and certainly Mr. Hauser or staff can, can jump up, there's no real uh, dispute over it. The, the county's position, as I understood it, Mr. Hauser can correct me, is that they did not feel comfortable issuing any permits with my client building within that strip. They were concerned that my client would not be able to have that right to put their house over that strip or, or impeding on it. Uh, but as long as the structures remained outside of that strip, the county thought it was a permittable project as long as we got this variance. Um, so there really isn't a dispute with the county that I'm aware, but John, if you want to- And I'll agree with that, and <clears throat> pardon me. And if I could actually, Ms. Clements, I may be more background on this one. If we could pull up the original plat from 1930, which is what touched off this whole issue about the alleged yeah. existence of this 10-foot beach access strip. And if you could, Ms. Clement, zone in on block one, lots eight and nine, uh, right there in the middle of the screen. That's the applicant's property tonight. And that dividing strip between lots eight and nine from the original 1930 plat are what caused the concern when Mr. Murray first contacted my office, I think all the way back in August, September last year, and we started trying to work this. And I will concur with Mr. Longmore's that the applicant and Mr. Longmore have been helpful and courteous in trying to work through this issue with us. Our issue is that that strip, as best we can tell, back in 1930 when the original subdivision was laid out, ought to have been deeded to out to somebody else. We can't find any record in the title where it in fact was, but neither can we find any record in the title that it land either went to lot eight or lot nine. So there's this question of who actually now, 93 years later, owns this 10 foot strip. And I think Mr. Longmore could tell you that if this matter ever did come push to shove, his clients would have uh, options and recourse in court. They could claim that they or their predecessors in title possessed it by adverse possession. At some point along in the last 90 years, they could potentially hire a title search that might clear this up. I think the path of least resistance and least expense, though, was to act upon the slim chance that that may not legally be part of lots eight and nine and act as though it is this independent 10 strip buffer and just seek setbacks. The reason the county could not originally at the off behest of the county attorney's office suggest that we could proceed without a side setback from that strip is because there is just that sliver of a possibility that there is a title issue here and that someone other than the record or title owners of lots eight and nine are the true 
heirs and holders of any interest in that property today. Again, I think that's a very unlikely chance in the reality of things. Our luck being what it is, we'd go say no setback is required, and the very next day, the great, great, great grandson of whoever would show up at the doorstep saying, what gives? But again, until we could say with finality that that issue was settled, our position was that we have to act as though that possibility is in fact the reality. Again, I will be the first to concede that it is an abundance of caution to say the least, but I do think legally it's what we're required to do unless we could resolve with utter and absolute certainty the issue to title today, which I don't think we can do absent a court order. So, so with all that being said, if I wanted access to St. George's River on that strip of land, I could take my boat down there? So that's Mr. Longmore's correct that that would be a private property dispute because what we can say of certainty is that land was not supposed to be deeded to the county. It was a right of easement, best we can tell, that would have been shared by the other owners of the subdivision that, again, they may very well have lost by virtue of adverse possession or abandonment or it simply never having been given. So the answer is you don't know. Like it was. Yeah, so we don't know. We do know that it wouldn't be a matter for the county commissioners. We don't assert a public right to be able to guarantee access. It's a right that other owners of the subdivision may hold by virtue of being property owners with a common easement if in fact it's there but it wouldn't be an issue for public enforcement and it wouldn't be land owned by the county commissioners the only reason the county commissioners have the other adjacent lot is that a few decades ago the county received and i don't know the circumstances behind it or why we did a number of lots in the property from a title owner uh, this lot still remains in the county commissioner's ownership and possession today not aware of any plans the county has to make use of the vacant property and that is the reason why we do not object and do not have an opinion one <coughs> way or the other to the propriety of a setback variance with respect to the common border with the county property uh, we trust the county commissioners trust the board of appeals to act judiciously and appropriately and will rule how they feel they should on that one Mr. Medinsky? Um, well, I'm still looking at the slide. It, are there other access to the uh, beach or the uh, river? So, uh, there's two, I was showing like two other access, 10 foot access. I, I'd need defer to either Mr. Longmore or his clients or the neighbors to answer that one. I do know that the plats obviously show that there are other access points. I can't tell you the status of those today. I, I can't tell you that this is not uncommon for, well, it's not common, but it's not the first time I've seen the problem either with subdivision plats from this age. I've encountered the exact same problem in Mill Point Shores up in my end of the county. I've seen it in Longview Beach. I've seen it twice in the Piney Point subdivision outside the Harry Lunderberg School. You just have these issues where almost a century ago, a subdivision plat was laid out, deeds weren't made, filled out, or were filled out and made and not recorded appropriately, but it has been lost to time, ultimately, what the resolution of it was but they're just these they're kind of a term within my department the department of public works and transportation called paper roads where we can see easements on the plat but for all intents and purposes that is the only place they exist but by virtue of being on the plat that does carry some legal significance so we, uh, title search has not been done uh, we've reviewed the title and i believe the county has to uh, we haven't had an abstract or search it but i i can do that as well and i know john has looked at some of the title w what we believe is that as it's shown here that strip has never been deeded out from the research that we've done now for, to be clear my client believes my client owns that strip through the theories that mr hauser has said uh, if anybody were to challenge that my client would be able to avail itself to go into circuit court and ask a judge to confirm that. My client would have to prove that they own it, but they would have to do that. Uh, but they can own it even without a court order. It's if somebody challenges it, a judge decides whether that's right or not. Uh, so my client's clear position is that they own it and they, they've taken many actions over the years to, to try to show that. Um, it's never been used to access the beach in any way. It's not really a public beach where it is. It's, it's private. Um, and I'll concur with Mr. Hauser that I've seen a lot of plats like this in this time period in the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, where plats were drawn this way 
um, and talking to my client, getting ready for the hearing. A lot of times the thought was this might be a cottage community from DC where it'd be a walkable community. Much of the beach that's shown here is not there anymore. It's all been eroded. Um, so a lot of it would go into the property lines now. So there really is no beach to go down to and use as the public anymore uh, because this plat was done, I believe, in 1930. So it's almost 100, 100 years old. So physically, the property is a lot different than it's shown here. So, um, so well. two last questions from me. If, in fact, <coughs> if, in fact, they own the land, we wouldn't, they wouldn't have to be asking for this 10-foot setback, correct? Correct. That's correct. Okay. And I don't know anything about title searches, <laughs> but how long does it take to get one? How long would it take them to, to clear this up so that they wouldn't have to go through this or be worried that one day someone's going to say, I want access down beside your house in between so, your, uh, what is it, boathouse? So a title search can't clear it up. It could show that maybe it was deeded to somebody, but we have not found that in our research of doing it. So a, a title search has different terms. You can go to an abstracting company that will pull the deeds for you, or in today's world, the land records are readily accessible online. I can do that pretty much that same search myself um, sitting at, at a computer. Um, we have not found where any of this has been deeded out to anybody. It looks like it's probably still in bare title to the developer of this property that developed it in 1930 when this plat was done. That's probably the last time there was a deed to this 10-foot strip of property. I believe that's what the title shows from what I've seen. Uh, but over time, property can also be acquired by use or by abandonment of the person. We believe that that, that is the case here. Legally, that means that if I'm correct, my client does own it now, but we don't have a title to show the county that we own it. So out of an abundance of caution that there could be somebody coming to challenge it that has never done it before, but all of a sudden they could wake up one day and do that. Um, instead of pushing hard against the county or, or running into court to try to resolve it, uh, my client tried to work with the county to come up with a solution that would work work with them and allow them to have reasonable use without having to go to that, that expense because nobody is challenging it that we're aware of. So. so I understand we're taking the most conservative approach here, but what's the timeline for the abandonment if um, a property is used or not used? When is it considered abandoned? 20 consecutive years, right, Mr. Long? Yeah, so, so acquiring it through adverse possession is a 20-year period. So if it's been treated as that landowner's property and there's various standards you've got to meet, um, then that is how to acquire it by adverse possession. There's also a different legal notion called abandonment that is slightly different where the owner, if they've taken actions to abandon something, you can prove that it was abandoned outside of that time period. We believe that this probably falls under, under both, either way that a court could rule uh, that it's really part of my client's property. To answer your question, there's um, to get it confirmed by a court could take year, years, depending on how the court docket. Take 20 right? years. Yeah, and a lot of expense to do it. Since nobody's challenging it, my client has decided to bear that risk and to go forward following the concerns of the county and, and develop the property in a way that would not um, interfere with that strip, even though we don't believe that anybody's claiming it or it's going to be used by anybody. Uh, but that way, if there was ever a challenge, my client would be in a position to deal with it. And they know that that's part of what they have and they're willing to, to go forward you know as we presented it tonight the whiff the whiff on the on the plat shows that this access is 10 feet that's correct and then the access that's being reserved and unimpeded on the property will also be 10 it's feet. 10 feet in the location shown on the plat and it looks as about i can't tell the distance without the scale but it looks like somewhere between the water and the house there is a tree line um, is there any path through that tree line to the water? Not, not a developed one or one that we could see use of, you know, in any regular. My client has gone down that way, but as far as I know, on that 10-foot strip, I'm not aware of any. Mr. Murray, is that correct? What was Would, the question, sir? If there's a path shown on that 10-foot strip on the property. They need if to you, swear I, I think we'll need somebody to swear in first. If you're going to sit there, Bill, you can use the microphone. Excuse me, sir. While you're standing, yes. would you raise your right hand? Yes. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. The question is, in the 10-foot easement, there's a tree line between the proposed house and the shoreline. 
Is there any type of a path or a walkway or anything in there? No, I visited this site many times. In fact, last time was Easter uh, this, this year, last weekend. There's no path there. Uh, talking to neighbors, maybe every occasion, every year or two, someone might walk across that property to go down for oysters, but mostly if anybody goes, it's around the county property along the shoreline. Uh, in fact, I found an old fence that crossed this easement at one time, or whatever the strip is, and um, there's evidence of an old house or cottage that was ripped down many, many years ago, probably on lot nine or 10, because the concrete and the rubble and everything is still there from when it graded it down or burned it down. But uh, no one is accessing it. In fact, the neighbors have posted the road private, no trespassing. So people were stopped even before they come back there because it's a private road. Um, most likely, when this plat was done in 1930, September 1930, September 20th, 1930, I think the intent of the surveyor or planner was to do a little cottage community where a lot everybody had access to the beach one problem with trying to get this abandoned is not known who owns it. Possibly you'd have to notify every homeowner in all 162 of them. Uh, it could take years to try to abandon it. So we try to come up with a design solution instead of a legal solution because a legal solution would get very, very expensive and very time consuming trying to abandon that strip. Um, so. It was, was not the easiest design to come up with, but uh, very good. It was quicker. Any other questions? The um, county commissioner land, or whatever is on the left hand side. Yes, I think it, it's lot 10 there, and lot 10, whatever yeah, part of lot 11 is left. So they don't have any plans for that at this time that you know of? Yeah, I'll let Mr. Hauser speak to that. And what impact would that have with this 10 foot? variance if they decided to build on that land it i don't believe it would have any impact like i said the commissioners acquired by deed a number of lots in this property about four or five decades ago I, i'm aware of no plans to make active use of that property and the county commissioners do not have any opposition to the variance being granted and i've not been given any indication that that would frustrate any plans or designs or aims of the county too bad you can't change 10 feet this way and that way you know <laughs> I'll give you 10. I'll take 10. <laughs> may, may I address something uh, here, please? Say what? Sure. May I address something? Sure. My first plan was to take the 10-foot strip and move it over to the county property. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But not knowing who owns it, we couldn't do that because that would have benefited the county also. But uh, I have that plan, but Mr. Hauser looked at it and so, you know, we just can't move property. No, no. <laughs> right. it, it, it would be a convenient and even in some ways elegant solution, but at the end of the day, we've got to remember that even if it's just a mere scintilla of a chance, somebody might have a property interest in that 10-foot strip, the other neighbors do. And this board has uh, amazing and majestic powers, but they do not go so far as to deprive someone of a property interest if someone does in fact have title to that property that's why in the county's opinion we had to tread carefully and not just ignore that very remote but still definitely present possibility that someone does hold title or if the neighborhood entire holds title to that 10-foot strip any other questions Nope. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And again, just for the record, I'll put the road maintenance agreement handed to Ms. Clements. I'll note that it's signed by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Aldridge, Mr. and Mrs. Blackwell, Mr. and Mrs. McGee, who are other owners in the property, as well as Rose Hill Properties LLC, my client. It's dated February of 2021. Um, so all four of those property owners are, are subject to that to uh, assist in maintaining the road that goes to the properties. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I will now open the public hearing to public testimony. Again, as a reminder, please state your name and address, and then I will swear you in. Good evening. My name is Michael Blackwell. I live at 17947 St. George's Park Road in, as you probably guessed, Tall Timbers. 
Okay, if you would raise your right hand, please. Do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Sit down if you feel more comfortable. I'm fine standing up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your service to the county, first of all. I did submit public comments. I want to make it clear that those were never made with any hostile intention to block this. We welcome a new neighbor. We simply had some concerns about this. And I'm very grateful to Mr. Murray, who has reached out to us and really allayed a lot of those concerns. So I'm here this evening to support this request for variance and specifically to have the house uh, immediately adjacent to the county property, uh, lot nine, uh, boarding the county property, and then for the boathouse to be able to be close to that 10 foot uh, access, which I, I hope that Rose Hill and, and Mr. Murray are ultimately able to claim somehow. Um, with the understanding that this variance does not mean that there's carte blanche for developing the property. So for example, uh, Mr. Longmore mentioned there's been substantial erosion on the uh, St. George's Creek there. And there is mature native trees growing right along that shoreline and uh, we would not like to see those taken out. And if there were, that there'd be some sort of hearing about that. Uh, Mr. Murray has said he has no intention of taking those out, and I'm grateful for that. We were concerned about the boathouse, but it turns out, so well, why isn't a boathouse in the water? It's got to have a boat, right? Um, apparently, no, it's going to be a workspace, a workshop. And we're comfortable with that. And he's calling that a boathouse because he didn't want to have to say, it's going to have to have a driveway to it or something like or a, a garage. He didn't have to have like a driveway going to it. Um, the property is very low lying. Um, in the pictures I provided, you see that that um, lot especially floods at least probably 12 or 15 times a year in a minor way. And at least once a year, the whole area gets covered with water and our houses are islands. So I think better be aware of that. Uh, I thought that only happened out on St. George's Island, but I was wrong. Um, so he's planning on building up the property, and I want to make sure when that happens that there's proper stormwater management, that it's not going to divert water to the other properties, but instead out. Um, I can confirm that there is no path at the end of that 10-foot right-of-way through the trees. Um, we've never even known of its existence. Um, I guess our other concern, and, and Mr. Longmore mentioned this about the road, there's going to be large vehicles coming down that road, which is gravel or just dirt in many cases. Um, when this happened before, it collapsed a culvert there, and we would very much like to have assurances ahead of time from Rose Hill and Mr. Murray that any damage to the road will be made good, not at the expense of the road maintenance agreement, but at the expense of the people who are caused that damage. Um, with that said, uh, as I say, um, we are, are happy to support this variance and would welcome Mr. Murray to the neighborhood and assist Rose Hill as much as we need to in making sure that that's going to be a great experience for Mr. Murray. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Your board members have any questions? No, sir. No. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to speak for or against the project? Seeing no responses, I'll close the hearing to public testimony and open it up for board discussion. I guess I do have one more question from staff. Um, some of the concerns that Mr. Blackwell had expressed, as I read them, I thought of them that will be covered with the plan review, the actual plan review itself. Uh, sediment control, uh, stormwater management will be waived um, that being to control the rain runoff um, because of the size of the lot. And because of the location of the lot within a floodplain, it'll be built up on stilts. I don't know if that's the correct word, but that'll be built up above the land lot level. Yes, it will have to be elevated to the proper base flood elevation. And it will not be a mound of dirt that, that no. comes up. It'll just no, sir. It will be the same built. elevation. Exactly. Okay. Well, okay. mitigation. Pardon? How about mitigation? Mitigation, critical area mitigation. It's for the IDA. It'll be one tree for every 100 square feet of new lot coverage. Okay, or three shrubs. 
And in addition to that, for every um, square foot of trees removed or canopy removed, they'll also have to plant that in canopy. Okay. For the critical area, for their buffer management. And they'll have to sign a, they'll have to have a buffer management plan and a CAPA critical area planting agreement. And it'll even have to get inspected for the UNO and then re-inspected two years later to make sure that it survives. Any other questions? Motion. Any other discussion? We have a motion. I guess everybody in favor of this, pretty much? I, I mean, I, I think we really need to add in that about the road. If that call, you know, with heavy equipment coming down, if that culvert collapses again, it's not a county road, right? That's right. That's Can, right. It's not a county road. That's correct. So some, I think we should add the road maintenance in there if it, if it gets damaged. The road yeah, shall be maintained in the existing or better condition the way it is during now. and after construction. Just to maintain it the way, or replace it the way that it is now. Okay. Do we have that authority? I can't hear you. I said, do we have that authority to make that part <coughs> of the variance? I think we make that a it's condition. It's a county report. road, right? Uh, yes, you can you can place uh, conditions on your grant of the variance. Um, I think, I, I guess I would add a personal opinion, so long as they are reasonably associated with the, the purpose and intent of the variance and the application. But I think uh, I want to be careful with the wording if you're going to add something about the private road and maybe, uh, you know, to indicate that if, if damage is caused during construction by heavy equipment or otherwise, um, I don't, and I, I guess I want to caution that we don't uh, inadvertently impose a maintenance obligation outside of the maintenance agreement uh, that's longer term, uh, if that I makes any sense. Yes, we've done that it, to say that um, during construction, if it gets damaged, yeah. that it gets put back the way it was previous to the. Or, or resulting from the construction or construction vehicles. Yeah. We've done that before. Yes. Right. Yeah. And I think that would indicate that once construction is finished, that goes away. Correct. Then the then the maintenance agreement would take over. Correct. That would be very yeah. short term, very specific, and then revert back to the maintenance agreement. Yeah. If it's gravel now, we're not going to ask you to put back asphalt. You know, but it has to be replaced the way that it is the day they start uh, construction. Or well, I understand what we're doing, but if we have some ruts in the road caused by the construction, who will say? You've done a good job. It's okay. Which one of the neighbors is it a collection of the neighbors? Who makes that decision that you rep you've repaired it? That's a good point. But I would think maybe those and those. I, I think we're looking at um, a standard of damage beyond normal wear and tear. Yeah. If there's damage, and I think um, there was uh, testimony about the culvert. That's obviously one thing. But any any damage beyond normal wear and tear caused by the construction or the construction vehicles. I don't know. I think we're opening up a can of worms if we yeah. do that. I mean, I'm not opposed to saying putting in a variance or a condition. I just think in this case, it's it's kind of outside of what we normally do. We have made sure that people put things back to rights, but that was a different circumstance. Um, and this is, is this a county road? Is the culvert in the county road or the private road? It's a private road, and they have a they have a, a road agreement. Right. I think so we could refer back to that road agreement. Who owns the road? So the road owner would be the one. And if it's the whole neighborhood, it's going to be a lot of different opinions. Well, it could be the owners or the the those um, partners of the road maintenance agreement. Okay, Your Honor. Well, no. if if the road agreement goes from lot number four to lot number seven. So you've got nine people that get a vote to, to say whether it's approved repair or not approved repair. Uh, the applicants provided a road maintenance agreement. I don't know if it looks rather short. I don't know if you'd like to refer to it. Or. Short. It, you know, it seems to me that it, it may all, parties have. That agreement may already address damage caused. Yeah by one owner or one owner's contractors or invitees. Uh, Mr. Longmore, do you know if it, it does address that? Uh, 
I don't believe it's that specific. The chair, the chair has the the copy that I brought with me tonight. Um, I will state for the record, and my client has authorized me to say this, that uh, my client will repair any damage to the road that occurs during construction by the construction workers beyond normal wear and tear, above and beyond what the road maintenance agreement requires. He's aware that that would be his responsibility, probably legally anyway, but he'll state it for the record with the neighbors here uh, that they are willing to make sure that that occurs. So that needs to be a condition that's fine, but I'll state it publicly so that, that it's in the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Longmore. I just know that we've done it before, and it seems like I'm going to be like Mr. Guy this time, um, uh, Mr. Bradley, that um, they did talk to each other, and they reached out, and they both embraced the, n the new neighbors. I think that's the least that we can do in this case. So. Okay. And since they're talking about it and they agree, all right, I'm more comfortable with it. Okay. Anybody want to take a crack in a motion? Can you make the motion? Well, I don't mind. <laughs> um, in the matter of VAAP 22-1932 Rose Hill Properties, have made a finding that the standards for granting a variance and the objectives of Section 24.3 and Schedule 32.1 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance have been met. I move to approve the variance request to reduce the left side yard setback from 10 feet to zero feet to construct a boathouse and to reduce the side yard setbacks from 10 feet to zero feet to construct a dwelling with two-story deck. And we want to add the one condition that the, uh, I, I don't know, you best word that best you can. I can use you want me to that. supplement your motion? Yes. yes. Um, that the applicant will uh, uh, repair and be solely responsible for any damage caused beyond normal wear and tear uh, as a result of the construction activities or by the, by way of construction vehicles during the, the term of construction. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is that, is that your part of your motion? Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Bradley. Aye. 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 As you can see, the board has approved your request for a variance. An order reflecting the board's decision will be prepared by staff and signed by the board within 60 days. A 30-day period follows from the date the order is signed, during which any aggrieved party may appeal the board's decision to circuit court. The recording secretary will email you a copy of the order once it has been signed. Thank you very much and good luck. Good luck. Our next item on the agenda will be a public hearing to uh, re review the Smeco Ridge substation conditional use application 220313. The conditional use approval is requested pursuant to chapter 25 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance for use type number 91, communication tower, commercial within a village mixed use center, the zoning district, and a variance from schedule 63.3A to modify the buffer yard planting requirements. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lewis B. Jenkins, Jr. on behalf of Southern Mariner Electric, the applicant, uh, as you've indicated, there are two requests of the board tonight. Uh, the first. First. Yep. We're going to have staff. Go <laughs> through it. It's okay. I understand you. <laughs> okay. The next public hearing is a conditional use application 22-313, the Smeco Ridge Communication Tower. They're requesting conditional use for use type 91 communication tower commercial within the village center mixed use zoning district and a variance from schedules uh, 63.3A to modify the buffer yard planting requirements. The legal advertisement was printed on March 24th and 31st, 2023 in the Southern Maryland News. Certified mailings were sent to the adjacent property owners located within 200 feet of the project property and a public hearing sign was posted on the property on or before March 29th, 2023. 
The property owner is Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative Incorporated, and the property consists of 1.47 acres and is concurrently developed with a Smeco substation. The property is located at, oh, um, yep, nope, that's not, oh, 49311 Bennett Drive in Ridge. The land use for the property is mixed use, lo low intensity, or excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes, mixed use, low, low intensity. It is zoned village center mixed use, or VMX. Okay, the property currently has a Smeco substation with an existing 10-foot gravel access drive and an antenna located on it. The applicant is requesting conditional use for the proposed 160-foot tall monopole tower located within the existing confines of the Smeco substation. They are also requesting a reduction from the 65-foot Type B buffer yard to a 30-foot Type B buffer yard for the front buffer yard along Bennett Drive. A reduction from the 65-foot Type B buffer yard adjoining the commercial properties to a 15-foot Type B buffer yard and a reduction from the required 30-foot Type C buffer yard to a 15-foot Type B buffer yard for the adjacent residential properties. Okay, it, this plan has been approved by the St. Mary's County Health Department, the St. Mary's County Metropolitan Commission, and the Soil Conservation District, and the Department of Public Works and Transportation. And it's currently um, pending site plan approval from Land Use and Growth Management pending this hearing. Okay, the existing tower is proposed to be removed after, after the installation of the proposed new tower. The proposed 160 foot tall tower is located within the existing confines of the Semeco substation, will be installed on an 18 foot by 18 foot mat foundation. The site plan depicts the proposed reductions to the buffer yard setback along with the plantings. Okay, the applicant is requesting a reduction from the 65 foot type B buffer yard to the 30 um, foot type B buffer yard for the front buffer yard along Bennett. Next, they're requesting the reduction for the 65 foot type B buffer yard for the adjoining commercial properties to a 15 foot type B buffer yard. And then lastly, they're requesting the reduction for the 30 foot type C buffers to the 15 foot type B buffer yards um, adjacent to the residential properties. A 30 foot type C buffer yard requires five canopy trees, seven understory trees, 27 shrubs, and 14 evergreens or conifers planted for every 100 feet adjoining the residential properties and an offense in a berm would be required. Um, this is a visual depiction of the B buffer yard standards. The B buffer yard standards are required along the right of way and for the commercial properties adjoining the project property. A 65 foot type B buffer yard requires four canopies, five understories, 22 shrubs, and 11 evergreens or conifers planted for every 100 feet. Okay, and this is the visual um, depictation of the C buffer yard. I've gone over the C buffer yard requirements of the five canopy, seven understories, 27 shrubs, 14 evergreens or conifers for every 100 feet and the berm. Okay. Next, we'll go over the standards for granting conditional use. Okay, um, no conditional use shall be approved by the board unless it finds that one, the conditional use complies with the standards of the district in which it's located and the standards are applicable to that use. And two, the establishment, maintenance and operation of conditional use will not be detrimental to or endanger the general public safety, convenience, morals, order, or the general welfare. Three, the conditional use will not be injurious 
to the use and the enjoyment of other properties within the immediate vicinity for the purposes already permitted and will not substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood and for the proposed use at the proposed location will not have any adverse effects above and beyond those inherently associated with the proposed use, irrespective of its location within the zoning district. And five, adequate utilities, access road, drainage, and or necessary facilities have been or are being provided. And six, adequate measures have been or will be taken to provide ingress and egress following a design that minimizes traffic congestion in the public streets. And seven, the proposed condition is not contrary to the goals, objectives, and policies of a comprehensive plan. And eight, the conditional use in all other respects conforms to the applicable regulations of the district in which it is located or to the special requirements established for that specific conditional use in the ordinance. Okay, and we've gone over the standards for, uh, the general standards for granting variances. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Were you going to go through the standards for granting a variance? It, it, we've gone through them, I can go through them again. No, no, that'd be fine. Okay. <laughs> any questions? No, those are. Mr. Jenkins, go uh, for Good evening again, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Lewis B. Jenkins, Jr., Jenkins Law Firm, on behalf of the applicant, Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative, Inc. As staff has indicated, we're here with uh, two requests. Uh, the first is conditional use approval for a uh, communications tower, and the second being a variance to the buffer yard standards. Uh, we will have two witnesses tonight. The first is Stacy Lagana of Lorenzi, Dodds, and Ganil. Mrs. Lagana will walk the board through our PowerPoint presentation. The second witness is uh, Mr. Hugh Vole, who is the uh, Director for Transmission, Engineering, and Construction for SMECO. He will answer any uh, technical questions that the board members may have. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, if I could have both witnesses sworn. Okay, if we could have them both stand, and we don't need you to say your names and address for record, we just had that. So do you declare and affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony, responses, and statements you may give will be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you, have a seat. Good evening, for the record, I'm Stacey Lagana with Lorenzi Dodds at Gunnell. So I just wanna run through the, the PowerPoint presentation with you, some of it will be repeat. Um, basically, we're here for, our request is twofold. We're here to um, request authorization for a conditional use and the variance to the buffer yard requirements. This has already been reviewed. Um, as previously shown on um, the other vicinity map, um, this is the project location. Um, it's at the intersection of Bennett Drive and Bennett Court, and it's north of the intersection of Point Lookout Road and Three Notch Road. Um, this is the existing site conditions. The site is 1.47 acres. Um, it's an existing substation dating back to the 1950s. Um, there's an existing 14 foot tower, I'm sorry, 140 foot tower um, shown here in yellow. Um, it's 70 year old, years old, it's corroded and in, dis in disrepair and it needs to be replaced, which is why we're here before you this evening. This is just another view, gives you another perspective of the existing communication towers location at the current substation. And again, this is another perspective showing you the existing communication tower location with reference to the adjoining uh, property owners. So first I'll touch on the conditional use and then we'll go into the variance. Um, so this is the conditional use site plan. Um, the existing tower location is shown here in red and the proposed tower is in blue. Um, the proposed tower is gonna be constructed approximately 30 feet east of the existing tower. Um, the existing tower will remain until the new tower is up and functional and then it will be taken down. Um, the new tower is designed with a 60 foot fall radius. Um, that's the area highlighted here in yellow. As you can see, the fall radius is contained within the property outbounds. And can I stop, stop you right there? It, it shows a circle for 60 feet, but the tower's 160 feet. 
Now, does that include any structures other than the SMECO structures in that 160 feet? It just for the design of the tower. It just it includes the uh, the proposed Smeco tower within the, within that sixty feet fall radius. If I understand the question, sir. I understand that, but what's in one hundred and sixty feet? Say say that doesn't perform the way it's supposed to. I can actually, I think I can answer you. The tower was designed with the weakest leg at the hundred foot elevation. And I read that. I understand okay. that. Uh, my question is, what is within the 160 Oh, I'm feet. sorry. There's a fence, I believe you can probably. Oh yeah, with, within, the 100, uh, within the 160 feet, it's all, all on the SMEC, it's uh, existing SMECO facilities, uh, so that the SMECO fence line and part of our substation equipment. But there's no other structures like, like someone else's property. Either. Oh no, the, everything is within our property. The 160 feet. No, the 60 foot fall radius. No, I, 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 underst <laughs> I, understand, I understand the question. Uh, the outside of the 160, uh, if you see on the display there, the, hundred, the 160 feet would would actually go outside of the Smeco property lines. Right. But that's the with that and with knowing that that specific why we had this tower specifically designed for the for, to main, to maintain the fall radius within the 60 feet. I understand I just, that. But my question is, what's in 160 feet? The, we have the homes, actually, the adjoining homes are great at least 200 feet away That's, from the proposed tower. Oh, I, I guess yes. I'm looking for The oh, sheds, yeah. there are some sheds that are within 100 feet, that within, are within that 160 feet, but the actual homes are outside of the 160 feet, the adjoining homes. Does that answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I just wanna run down the general condi conditional use standards um, that are required for a project such as this. So it must comply with the standards of the D district, the VMX uh, Village Mixed Use District. In this case, um, the district allows for residential and compatible commercial development. There's also, this area is also designated as a village center and the replacement tower has been reviewed by the TEC and found to be in compliance with all the standards of the district. Um, it will not be detrimental to or endanger the public health, safety, convenience, morals, order, or general welfare within the neighborhood. Again, um, I feel like a broken record, but this is an existing substation and it's just a tower that's being replaced. So it's an existing condition that we're actually improving. Um, this will not be detriment, detrimental to the neighborhood um, because it is already in existing use. Um, will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment and not substantially diminish or impair property values within the neighborhood. Um, again, this tower has been there for 70 years. Um, the tower replacement will not be injurious to use, enjoyment, or diminish property values. Um, no adverse effects above and beyond those inherently associated with the proposed use. Um, again, this is an existing use and we're just replacing the existing tower with a new one that's 20 feet taller. Um, adequate utilities, access roads, drainage, and or necessary facilities are provided. Um, this use is existing, so all applicable access and utilities are already provided to the site. Um, we have adequate ingress and egress. Um, there's already an established 10-foot uh, roadway that accesses the site um, and the construction of the tower. Um, there'll be some increase in trips with the construction, but generally there'll be no increase in trips to and from the site. Um, this is not contrary to the comprehensive plan. Um, the comprehensive plan actually states that the county will support SMECO's initiatives in the county. Um, and also conforms to all the applicable regulations. Um, it's gone through the TEC review and found to be in compliance with all of the, um, the applicable regulations. Um, the conditional uses also have some use specific standards. Um, one of those is that the site plan approval shall be required, which we have done that. Um, commercial communication towers shall meet the general standards and purpose for public safety communication towers. We have met all of those standards. Um, and also there's also extensive conditional standards that are set forth for use 91, which the TEC has reviewed and found to be in compliance. Um, so now we will move on to the buffer yard variants. Um, the variants to the buffer yard standards, um, as shown here, basically the justification for this variance is due to the fact that this is an electrical substation and the amount of overhead lines coming to and from this station. Um, trees growing near power lines can pose a fire hazard as well as an electrical hazard. Um, trees can also pose a risk to the reliable delivery of electricity as they mature, and I'm sure Hugh can talk more to that. 
Um, basically, there's uh, no existing vegeta vegetation will be disturbed for the proposed tower construction. Um, on this exhibit, the light green uh, solid hatch is the existing vegetation. None of that will be removed with this tower construction. Um, the existed I'm sorry, um, SMECA recognizes the buffer yard requirement and has agreed to a muffer, modified buffer with vegetation no greater than 12 feet in height, and that's for safety reasons for the existing substation. So we are providing a 30-foot buffer yard type B along Bennett Drive, um, and along both sides of the property, we're providing a 15-foot buffer yard type B, and then to the rear there, we're providing a 30-foot buffer yard type C. Um, currently, the only vegetation that exists surrounding the substation are the areas in green shown here, the solid green area. Um, we are, are we'll, all vegetation will be native species, and also we're not proposing any plantings directly under overhead power lines. Um, that's why you see the blank white areas um, throughout the buffer yard because there are overhead power lines in those locations. So as you know, we're required to meet several variant standards, and I'll just run through those. Um, due to the physical surroundings, such as exceptional narrowish, narrowness, shallowness, size, shape, or topographical conditions of the property, strict enforcement of the ordinance would result in practical difficulty. Um, due to the nature of this use as an electrical substation, the strict enforcement of the ordinance would not only result in practical difficulty, but also be a safety issue as well. Um, conditions creating the difficulty are not applicable generally to other properties within the same zoning classification. Um, this is a condition unique to an electrical substation and overhead power lines in gen are generally not applicable to other properties. Um, not based exclusively upon reasons of convenience, profit, or caprice. Um, none of these things apply here. This is more of a safety issue. The alleged difficulty has not been created by the property owner or the owner's predecessors in title. Again, this is an existing substation, tower, and overhead lines, and the difficulty was not created by the property owner. Actually, um, with the planting of the buffer yard, they're making the situation, I believe, improving the situation. Um, will not be detrimental to the public welfare, injurious, or to other property improvements in the neighborhood and character of the district will not be changed. Um, this proposed variance will actually, again, improve the existing conditions and provide a landscape buffer to those surrounding homeowners. Will not substantially increase congestion in public streets, increase danger of fire, endanger public safety, or substantially diminish or impair property values. Um, we're seeking this variance for public safety, um, and it will actually decrease the danger of fire with um, you know, having the 12-foot trees and you know, no conflict with the power lines. Um, <clears throat> the variance complies as nearly as possible with the spirit, intent, and purpose of the comprehensive plan. Um, in order to be consistent with the code and comp plan, we are planting a buffer. We're just, act we're just asking for a variance from the type and width due to safety concerns. And with that, I'll... Any questions of Mrs. Lagana? Mr. Any questions of the board? Does the current tower have a light on it? No, there's no light on the current tower and there's no lights proposed on the existing tower either. Um, but I guess Webster Field, have they been contacted or? Yes, Webster Field, because we've it's actually gone through, we've received our FAA, FAA review and approval and part of that it was submitted to the to the Navy and they reviewed everything and they found no uh, no, no impacts from the new tower being installed. Okay, and the only other thing, it says it has to be, your, t your tower has to be made avail available to other users or not? What's no, we have the, we have, at, there is a adequate capacity and, and space on the tower to co to co-locate additional antennas. And that's something where uh, one, when, when approached, we evaluate on a case by case basis to, to make sure we still maintain the integrity of the tower without interfering with SMECO communications, but that there is the, that space is available. Sir. There we go, I'm good. Okay, and this tower is primarily for SMECO communications at this time. Yes, this tower is uh, specifically being, uh, being installed for SMECO communications. Um, this is to support two, two uh, I want to say, key um, aspects of our of our business. First, it supports the, what I say, our, op our operations. This is a remote, like I said, the substations, it's monitored remotely. So this is how uh, our operations center is able to communicate and uh, remotely control the equipment in the substation. And it's also where it supports the, our, our AMI, which is our automated meter reading infrastructure as well. Is this for the sole use of Smetco? 
Could another company come in and, and, and uh, rent a spot on the tower or use it like Ver Verizon, whatever? Yes, there. If they, they, this, uh, there is at, there is. I can hear you, sir. There is adequate space available on the tower if a uh, if a third party was to approach Smeco and there's and there is a we have a process in place where we work with them to to value to evaluate the equipment they want attached to make sure um, it's the tower can handle it and it does not interfere with the uh, in original use for Smeco. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm good. And, and you currently have no plans to co-locate. The, the the intent as of today is to. Uh, exclusively use it for Smeco. The intent as today is this tower specifically being des designed and installed for the use of Smeco and Smeco only. There are there are no plans for any other additional uh, parties to be co-located at this time. And is the addition of 20 feet in height uh, for the purpose of improving your communications within your uh, AMI, for example? Yeah, the, addition, the additional height is to improve to, if you're familiar with that, is for line of sight, is to help to improve the communications because it's all done. This is through uh, radio and wireless communications and to help improve the reading in the base that the, to cover for our automated meter reading. And can you just touch on briefly the current condition of the existing tower? Yeah. The ex like I said, the existing tower, you said, as Stacy uh, pointed out in the presentation, you know, the Ridge substation dates back to 1950s. You know, this is in the tower that was installed down there. And we've discovered through um, routine maintenance and inspection through creation, there's starting, the, there's starting to be concerns about the structural integrity of the existing tower out there. So that's why Smeco, we're taking the proactive approach that we realized that, that the tower is starting to fail and we want to go ahead and replace, uh, replace, the, replace the, put in a new tower now and transfer and retire the old one before uh, it fails. And I believe you've already testified that once the new tower is constructed and operational, your intent is to promptly remove uh, the existing tower? Yes, once the new tower is constructed and we expect the construction window to be about two to three months uh, total for the new tower to be installed and complete. And then once the new tower is uh, complete and operational, the existing tower will be uh, removed uh, right afterwards. I have no further questions. Any other comments, questions? In that case, I'll open the meeting to public testimony. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak for or against this project? Hearing none, I'll close the meeting to public testimony. Um, board discussion. I'm good. And they provided a lot of info and read through it all. So. Being familiar a little bit with co-location of facilities for telephone companies, I might suggest you go out and seek that. I do pay a smacko bill. <laughs> do we have a motion? I'm, I'm happy with, with the answer oh, you gave me about another company coming in and util utilizing a tower. I think that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the sooner the better. Any other questions, comments? Do I have a motion? And we do have some suggested conditions here before us also for the conditional use part. So I guess we'll have to make this in. Mr. Two. Chair, I, I shared those conditions with the applicant and I don't believe they have any issues or concerns with them. Very good. Two motions or one? How did we prepare this? So I, I think uh, appropriately two motions. Okay. Somebody want to take a crack at that? <laughs> it's a convoluted one. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay. All right. Let's see. In the matter of uh, CUAP 22-0313 Smeco Ridge Communication Tower having made a finding that the standards for granting the conditional use of the objection of objectives of section 53, <coughs> excuse me, section 51.3.91 of the St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance. And we have to include the suggested uh, conditions for orders, which have already been submitted and shared. 
So do I need to read each one of them? Um, I think we can take record notice of those. Um, just to, is that what it says on the top? Just yes, to, that's what it says on the top. Okay. All right. All right. So we'll take notice. And that of and that that is of record, and the the applicant has seen it. All okay. Right. <clears throat> St. Mary's County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance have been met. I move to approve the request to allow the proposed communication tower commercial use 91 within the village center mixed use zoning district and have made a finding that the standards for granting a variance in the objectives of section 63.3. No use. Uh, yeah. no. Yes. Variance, it's a conditional use. Conditional use. Period. Conditional with, with use. With these conditions. Correct. 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 We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now pick up, I guess, where you left off. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. The run on sentence got me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Where it says section 63.3. Yep, section 63.3, buffer yards and schedule 63.3A. Buffer yard standards of the St. Mary County Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance have been met. I move to approve the variance request to reduce the required 65 foot type B buffer yard along Bennett Drive to a 30 foot type B buffer yard. The required 65 foot type B buffer yard adjacent to commercial properties to a 15 foot type B buffer yard and the required 30 foot type C buffer yard adjacent residential properties to a 15 foot type B buffer yard. Does that cover the two items requested the, in the variance, the limiting height of the trees and the open space where the existing transmission lines are? Dan, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. If I could make a suggestion, maybe we can use um, as delineated on Exhibit 2, Attachment 4, the site plan. <laughs> exhibit 2, Attachment 4, mm -hmm. which is the site plan. Yeah. That would which be okay would show. Uh, that, that would be fine. We can attach that to the order. All right. All right. Do I need to repeat all that? <laughs> it, so clarify. go ahead and pick up with as delineated by. <laughs> as delineated by the site plan shown on I hope Mr. Hauser, when he writes this order, can follow this. I hope so. Uh, let's see, as delineated by the site plan on, which one was it? Sorry. Site plan attachment four. Yeah, exhibit two, attachment four. Yeah, exhibit two, exhibit two attachment four. Very good. That work? That works. I think that does. Perfect. That works. Second. Second. Thank goodness, because I ain't reading that again. <laughs> I thought that was very good. You very <laughs> Goodness knows what you'll get. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. As you can hear, the board has approved your request. An order reflecting the board's decision will be prepared by staff and signed by the board within 60 days. A 30-day period follows from the date the order is signed in which any aggrieved party may appeal the board's decision to circuit court. The recording secretary will mail you a copy of the order once it has been signed. Thank you very much and good luck. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> okay. First of all, we have approval of the minutes of March 9th, 2023 meeting. And I believe those have been passed out. Do any members have any revisions, questions, or concerns? No. Make a motion. We approve the minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Then we have several uh, set of orders to approve. The first is for the Abbott property, which was uh, a request to disturb the critical area buffer for the expansion of existing deck and patio. And that was approved by everybody with the exception of Mr. Medinsky. So I'll take a motion for me to sign the order. Make a motion to sign the order. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The next one I have is Taylor 
Yvonne Ayan property, which was a request to disturb the critical area buffer to replace a brick walkway and patio culvert and retaining wall. And all of the members voted to grant approval of the amendment. Make a motion to sign the order. Second. All in favor? Aye. The next item I have is the Raffi property, and that was a request to disturb the critical area buffer and to disturb an expanded non tidal wetland buffer to construct a single family dwelling with a detached garage. And that was approved by all of the board members. Take a motion to approve that. Make Sign. a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The last one I have is Okoneski, and his request was to um, disturb the critical area buffer for an after the fact wood ramp from and form from schedule 32.1 for a reduction of the mandatory front and side yard setback uh, to construct a shed. And that was voted again 5 0, voting for that. Make a motion, sign the order. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Now I'd like to invite up Mr. John, or is it Mr. Phil? <laughs> and the 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 uh, I'll let John's going to explain most of what he has done. But what I had done, my part in this, was to commit for a special board meeting on Mart, uh, May twenty fifth. 25th, 25th, and John will explain what that's all for and where we go next after that. Let me double check my own date on that one, May 25th, yes sir. Um, as the board knows, we, as I believe the board may know, I think we've said before, there is a medical cannabis growing facility under construction at 21416 Abel Road down the 7th District. Uh, there was a Site plan approved by Lugham uh, back in the fall of October 21. There was a building permit issued at that time. There was subsequently an amendment to that site plan in October of last year, in which the applicant, after receiving approvals of a septic site plan from the local health department, wanted to expand their uh, septic facilities at their location. The ultimate effect of it would be to allow the number of concurrent employees they could have in the uh, building at one time. The a uh, number of neighboring property owners lodged an appeal, both of the Maryland Department of the Environment and Health Department's decision to approve the septic plan on their end and on Lugham's uh, decision to allow the applicant to amend the site plan at Lugham pursuant to those MDE approvals. My understanding is that the MDE approvals are still under an administrative challenge, although MDE has not issued a stay and has issued septic permits pursuant to that septic site plan, originally we were holding the local appeal at Lugham in abeyance to see if the MDE challenge would be resolved in the neighbor's favor. If it would, that would render the decision by Lugham moot and there would be no need to make an appeal. Uh, since MDE is allowing them to move forward though, that makes it ripe for the a local appeal to be heard by the Board of Appeals. Uh, so through the consent of the parties involved, the counsel for the property owner at the cannabis growing facility, counsel for the neighbors, the department, and Mr. Ignialski and Mr. Scott, we settled upon a uh, pre-hearing schedule, so to speak. Uh, we do know that the property owners will be issuing a motion. They have filed a motion to dismiss on legal grounds, stating that there, though we've had an appeal, there really isn't any legally cognizable claim to base that appeal on. There's going to be arguments made on May 25th by the property owner why that should be so. We are waiting the filing of a response by the property owners. Uh, arguing that, and he will obviously argue the other side. 
should the Board of Appeals decide that there are grounds to hear the appeal at all, there's been a public hearing scheduled on June 8th. Uh, the May 25th legal motions hearing for the board is the special meeting that Chairman Nikniowski referred to. I don't want to say too much more uh, without other parties present. I certainly don't want to speak on any merits of the case. It is a decision of Lugum that's being challenged, so I will participate in so far as to defend Lugum's decision and state the grounds for that. Uh, but other than that, if there are questions of procedure or the timeline, I'm sure it is probably appropriate to field a question to something like that. So, um, so procedurally, the first hearing will be on the motion to dismiss and we'll hear from the parties on that motion to dismiss and that'll be all we hear that night. Depending on the outcome, then obviously we may or may not need the actual hearing on the merits. Um, and um, John and I have seen the motion to dismiss. It will eventually make it into a packet for you all. The opposition to the motion to dismiss is due tomorrow, I believe, my calendar's correct. And so, um, as you can imagine, this is a very legalistic sort of argument um, and consideration for us. So uh, uh, your attorney will be ready for all of that and we'll, uh, we'll make our way through it. So we'll hear from three groups, the property owners, being the marijuana deal, uh, <laughs> growers. Uh, the second will be the residents of the area, and then the third will be county government. Logan, yes. Correct. And then we will hear the motions from each of those and make a decision as to what is to correct to go forward or not to go forward. Correct. Okay. There's my guys. Is this a de novo a, a situation? I, mean, I think it, it would be de novo. You would stand in you stand in the shoes of the planning director and decide whether or not the planning director made the right call. So we're are we allowed to do any research prior to that on this issue? I'm going to let Mr. Scott advise you on that ground. I uh I think um what I would like to do in that respect let's wait and see how the motion hearing goes and let, him, let me consider that further. Um, Mr. Bradley, what kind of research did you have in mind? This issue is going to be very technical. And when it comes to the property law, uh, I mean, it is, it's gonna be pretty much three different sides arguing about why it should go forward. It's a little bit beyond what I'm used to when it comes to these type of cases. So I was wondering if I could look up and see what Maryland law states about this type of facility. Uh, Mr. Bradley, you could consider doing what your lawyer tells you and only that. <laughs> <laughs> wing wing no, it. but I understand. I, um, I, I will certainly, given that that is a question for legal advice, I, all joking aside, I, I will absolutely defer to Mr. Scott on that one. Won't yeah, I, I, you know, obviously there's nothing to, uh, um, Nothing in your membership on this Board of Appeals and nothing that I could advise that prevents you from reading and looking at uh, information in open sources on the internet and that kind of thing. Um, I'd caution against specific information about the case, uh, whether it's you know wanting to make a site visit or, or things like that. I think we, um, we have, uh, when we start really getting into substantive facts and issues about the case itself, we, we get into uh, questions of, I don't know, uh, ex parte communications and open meetings and those kind of things. So I think uh, if you wanna look at open sources and um, take a look at those things, I would say keep an open mind and um, you know, there's nothing that we uh, would do to prevent you from doing that. No, I was not gonna look like social media posts or anything like that, I wanted to look on state government websites to go see what the rules are about these type of facilities in the I, state I, of Maryland. I will say to that, Mr. Bradley, the, the, at least the first, the first particular proceeding is more, uh, or hearing we're going to have is much more procedural. Mm -hmm. And it, um, 
we'll deal primarily with issues of this board's jurisdiction. If I can you know, sort of kind of sort of narrow it down and it's to its most you know narrow sense, it'll it'll deal a lot with this board's jurisdiction. Um, uh, if 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 and when the substantive hearing is is undertaken by this board, um, there again the the question is relatively narrow, and again I don't want to get into it too much, but um, I'm not sure how much value general looking at you know cannabis facility law is going to do for you, but certainly okay. um, it, it's uh, it's up to you. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Anything else for the good of the cause? Uh, we have a, a tentative date. Or did yes, it was the 25th, okay. May 25th. Okay. That's what I, I have. I'm good with that date. It's 6, it's six o'clock. May 25th at 6.30. 6.30? Um, <laughs> yep, uh, only different instead of the second Thursday, it's the fourth Thursday of the month. So you'll still have the meeting on, I think that is May. 11th, I believe. Right. What is 25? 25 May 11th. I can, I can do well. that math in my head. <laughs> this new math is terrible, isn't it? <laughs> it it's been a long week. <laughs> um, you'll still have the regular meeting on May 11th to hear the normal panoply of variants, conditional uses, whatever the soup du jour may be that day. But there will be a special meeting set aside again on May 25th, 630 here in the commissioner's meeting room, uh, solely and uh, singularly devoted to, again, that legal argument on whether there is any grounds to base an appeal upon at all. And I'll also note, uh, just for clarity's sake now, is that it is not necessary to have a public hearing at that meeting. That would only be presentation and arguments on the law by counsel. And that, that actually is a very good point. We won't be hearing from the public at large at that point. But it will be publicly broadcast. It will, yes. It will. The Open well, Meetings Act will Guarantee you we will have the public present in the seats behind us, yes. but it will not be a public hearing. What do we got coming up? So one more um, item on the agenda, if you don't mind. Um, we passed out a revised version of the schedule for this year, uh, hearing schedule. Um, there are just some slight changes in the dates as it relates after February. I got a little mixed up, and um, so that's been corrected. Um, if we could take a quick vote on that, that would be great. Looks good to me. Okay, so Lynn is makes motion, motion to approve. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Gotcha. And then um, for the coming hearing on May 11th, I could go over those quickly if you'd like. Yes. Okay, so there are four hearings set for that date. Uh, the first is um, 235 Farm and Outdoor Sports. They're requesting a variance from Buffer Yards as well. That property is located at 23200 Three Notch Road in California, Maryland. Uh, we have a hand berry, the Hanbury variants are requesting uh, variant, uh, setback variances uh, for a gazebo um, to be located closer than 10 feet from their pool. That property is located at 21581 Montford Road in Bushwood. And then we have Cheseldine and Dickerson. That's a variance for the critical area variance, the 100 foot buffer for a replacement house on an existing foundation. That property is 37230 Gibson Road in Bushwood. And then we have the burned variance requesting a critical area variance as well to construct a new deck and add a landing and stairs to an existing deck the property located at 39666 Cecil Avenue in Leonard Town. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Busy night. Sounds like a, yeah. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Very good meeting.